a little girl growing up in India, I was painfully shy. I didn't talk much. I let my brother do the talking for me, and he was pretty good at it. But you know, I was never lonely because I had powerful friends. Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, these were my friends. And I would dream of going on adventures with them and help to save the world. But I needed a superpower. And I couldn't quite decide what superpower I wanted. Super speed, super strength, supervision. I didn't really know until I grew up and became a quantum physicist. <laughs> when I started exploring the world of quantum physics, I found that quantum particles like electrons and photons and atoms, they can do some really strange things like be in two places at the same time, or walk through walls, or instantly connect across space and time, kind of like superpowers. But the most important of these quantum superpowers had nothing to do with speed or strength, but it was way more surprising. And I want to show you that this superpower not only transformed my life, but is a huge driver of future quantum technology. The power I'm talking about is shape-shifting. You've probably seen shape-shifting in Hollywood. Because Hollywood movies, they know a lot about quantum physics, apparently. <laughs> this is an image of a character called Mystique, who is a shapeshifter. This is from the X-Men movie. And she is shapeshifting into another character, X, uh, Iceman. So Mystique usually tries to maintain a particular identity, but she can be whoever she wants, and we don't really know what her true identity is. Maybe she doesn't have one. In the quantum world, everybody is like mystique. Particles like photons and electrons, they don't have a unique, precise identity either. We cannot know everything about a quantum particle. And this property is something called quantum uncertainty. For example, if we try to measure exactly the location of an electron, we will not know anything about how fast it's moving or which way it's going. And if we precisely measure how fast it's going and which way it's uh, traveling, we will not know anything about its location. It's really weird, but it's real, and I personally could relate to that. <laughs> so when I started doing quantum physics, I started noticing that my research teams and my classes started looking something like this. I was often the only woman in the room, and I noticed an interesting phenomenon. If I was viewed more as a physicist, I was kind of less of a woman. And if I was viewed more as a woman, I was seen as less of a physicist. More precisely female, less precisely physicist. More precisely physicist, less precisely woman. I was facing quantum uncertainty. <laughs> So to resolve this uncertainty in my identity, of course, I turned to science. Now, you might think in science, uncertainty is a very bad thing. Because how do we measure things and, and know things if there's so much uncertainty? But in fact, uncertainty actually has always been a driver of scientific progress. For example, in the early 1600s, a scientist named Johannes Kepler was analyzing the orbits of the planet Mars. And what he found was that there was a small uncertainty between what was observed and the current theoretical model of the time. And it was a tiny bit of uncertainty, just a f less than two-tenths of a degree, but he did not ignore it. And eventually, he realized that there was an error in the orbit of M Mercury, the, the theoretical model. The model said that the orbit of Mercury was actually a, a circle. But in fact, the true orbit is an ellipse, just like all the other planets. And this was a huge discovery. Before this, for thousands of years, humans had believed that the Earth was the unmoving center of the universe. Thanks to Kepler's kinds of careful uh, analysis, followed by Galileo and later Newton, we eventually figured out that we are not the center of the universe. About 300 years later, Mercury's orbit, in fact, also played a role in a huge scientific revolution. 
So as Mercury orbits the sun, the entire orbit actually slowly swings around over many, many years. And this is what we call precession. And again, scientists noticed that the observed rate of precession didn't quite match the theory. It was off by about 7%. But that 7% was incredibly important. In 1915, uh, Einstein came up with his general theory of relativity, which described planetary motion in a completely different way. According to his theory, massive objects like the sun can actually curve space. And because of that curvature, planets follow the curve and, and therefore fall into orbits around the sun. And if you use this idea of curvature of space and calculated the orbit, the discrepancy disappeared. So hidden in that 7% uncertainty was one of the first confirmations of this huge new theory. And there are many such examples. In fact, almost all scientific ideas have, have progressed because the old models had uncertainties and errors in them. But in the quantum world, uncertainty is a completely different thing. In quantum physics, the uncertainty is not about having observations and a theoretical model and trying to bridge that gap. In quantum physics, uncertainty is built into the theory itself. You just cannot get around it. So for example, for, for an electron, we cannot know its position as well as its speed and its direction all at the same time, not because we don't have good detectors, but because it is fundamentally unknowable. These particles do not have that kind of a precise identity. They are true shapeshifters. And that's a pretty amazing idea, right? And in fact, it brings up all kinds of philosophical questions, such as, how do we really understand and control a universe that is inherently full of uncertainty. Even Einstein struggled with this idea his whole life. But in Hollywood movies, shape-shifting is a superpower. So maybe even in science, it's not such a bad thing. And in fact, quantum uncertainty actually is like a resource, a fuel that we can use, and it has surprising power. For example, let's say you want to um, think about uncertainty as a form of lack of information. Well, if you don't know any, everything about a system, it may provide a way to hide information and therefore give us new ways to think of encryption. Let's say Alice wants to send a message to Bob, a secret message. So to be secret, she wants to encode it in such a way that only Bob will be able to decode it with the correct key. So first she has to send a secret key to Bob. And after that she can send public messages, but they'll be encoded so nobody else can read them. So in order to do this, what Alice can do is she can um, take photons, which are individual particles of light from a laser, and in each photon she will encode a, a bit of data, a zero or a one, using something called the polarization of light. And if Bob uses the same polarizer that Alice does, then he will be able to read out the bit that Alice wants to send. And if she does this with many, many photons, Bob will eventually receive a key. However, what if there is an eavesdropper, Eve, who steals and intercepts those photons and reads them out herself? When she reads it, the photons, in fact, are destroyed, so she has to duplicate those photons and send them on to Bob to hide her tracks. However, this is where quantum uncertainty plays a role. Because of uncertainty, the eavesdropper, Eve, will never be able to perfectly replicate each photon and hide her tracks. And Alice and Bob will always be able to detect the tampering, no matter how careful Eve is. She cannot violate the laws of physics, after all. And in future years, maybe Eve will get hold of amazing supercomputers and become very powerful. It will still not help her because this is not about computing power. The encryption here comes from fundamentally the uncertainty built into quantum physics. So this is the only completely secure encryption protocol that we know of today. And it all comes from the power of quantum shape shifting. And why stay, stop at one photon and just zeros and ones in each photon? Turns out, if you shine a laser at a nonlinear crystal, then every once in a while, 
you will get a pair of photons being produced. And if the laser beam is on, then eventually those photons, that, those beams of light, will come out as, as cones of light, as shown here. And if you look at the intersection of those cones, then you will see that those pair of photons ha are actually connected in this interesting way. Their polarizations are locked together so that either both photons are zero or both photons are one. But quantum uncertainty still plays a role. Individually, we don't quite know is, is photon one a zero or, and photon two a zero or are they one? We cannot tell individually what they are. But we know that if photon one is a zero, photon two is also a zero, or the other way around. So this weird combination of uncertainty in the individual particles combined with certainty in the two particles together is what we call entanglement. And this is also a very interesting, bizarre thing, but it is also powerful. So in my research team, we spend a lot of time obsessing about entanglement. We think about not just two particles, we add in more and more and more quantum particles, and we think about how we can build networks of entanglement. What would that mean? And different particles interact in different ways. So we can find out interesting properties and structures in this network of entanglement. And, and we can find new ways of building these kinds of networks with photons. And once we can generate these using current technologies, we dream up fun things to do with them, such as network teleportation, or a way to implement quantum voting where all the votes are teleported. Wouldn't that be amazing? So it's a lot of fun, but we're only just starting out. There's a lot more to discover here. And one of the other possibilities is to expand the network and eventually perhaps have a security-based quantum internet, but also build more powerful quantum computers in some way. We don't have quantum computers today, unfortunately, not yet at least, but we do still have a lot of computational power. So we are generating enormous amounts of data about our behavior, our bodies, our environment. There's so much data, so the challenge of searching the data and sorting it and analyzing it is becoming really difficult, kind of like looking for needles in a haystack. Well, one possible solution is to think of a quantum haystack and try to use this new sort of superpower of quantum uncertainty to make better, more efficient search algorithms. And the idea would be to manipulate the uncertainty that's built into the theory in such a way that all the things that you're not searching for, the wrong answers to your question, their uncertainty gets decreased, and the one correct answer becomes more and more certain. And this is indeed possible. It's an algorithm called Grover's algorithm, and there are many companies and research teams around the world trying to implement these kinds of search algorithms. And perhaps there are tasks that we haven't even dreamed of as yet that we could perform with quantum superpowers. So the future of quantum is very interesting and exciting and uncertain. And as for me personally, in my own search for my, my identity as a woman and a physicist, the message from the quantum world is clear. I don't have to be one or the other. I can be both. I can be neither. I can shapeshift between one and the other in any way I want. Because quantum uncertainty, and uncertainty in general, uncertainty of identity, is not a weakness. It's the ultimate superpower. <laughs> so perhaps we should all be shapeshifters. Thank you.